class, picture this. It's 2007. President George W. Bush has just initiated the surge, sending 20,000 American soldiers to the war in Iraq. The subprime mortgage crisis is just beginning. Big Bang Theory has just begun terrorizing millions for years to come. But the real battle of 2007 is waging on schools versus students, parents versus kids, the world versus Heelys. I swear you could not go to any public space in 2007 without seeing a giant sign banning Heelys. I mean, suddenly the generation that had to be convinced to wear a seatbelt in cars could not fathom the extreme sport sweeping the nation. I mean, kids these days, why don't they just walk into strangers' homes and play with asbestos on the highway like the good old days? Was that what it was like? I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there because I'm young, hip, and Heelys are cool, Mom. All right, so if you can't tell, I've been thinking about Heelys a lot lately. And if you miss these things, Heelys were like these sneakers that came with wheels in the bottom. You could pop in and out. Basically, you could roller skate whenever they wanted to. And uh, might I say, look hella cool while doing it. They came in a wide array of styles, all with very specific names, such as Stealth, Rage, Predator, Torch, and Slicker 9016. These babies supposedly could go up to speeds of 30 miles per hour. I mean, you were not cool unless you had a pair of these, and I didn't have them. And I look like this. 2007 was not my year. But today, we are making up for lost time, because as much as these were a staple of mid-2000s culture, not enough people know the full story, the lore, the legend of Heelys. And I'm here to pass that knowledge on to you all today. You're welcome. And just like any good video essay, this story doesn't start with the release of Heelys in 2000s. No, we, we need to go back slightly further. The early 1900s was the golden era for American roller skating. In 1902, the Chicago Coliseum opened the first public skating rink, with over 7,000 people attending the opening night. A 1917 article from the Scientific American predicted roller skates would one day be used for the rapid transportation of soldiers, since a soldier could skate at about three times the speed at which they would ordinarily walk. I, for one, say we get rid of all these guns and like nuclear warfare and just have roller derby to decide all of our world conflicts. I, for one, nominate Chase Hudson to serve the United States and serve generally. In 1930, two teenagers, Dolores Prangle and Roger Adams, would meet and fall in love at their local skating rink. These two would spend their 71 years of marriage completely dedicated to their shared love of skating. In 1947, they opened their first roller rink, the Tacoma Roller Bowl in Tacoma, Washington. After a fire destroyed the original rink, the Adams would open their new facility, the Adams Tacoma Roller Bowl, which they ran from 1952 to 1984. At the opening night of the second rink, Dolores and Roger can be seen skating with their two daughters, Skip and Lynette. Technically, Skip's name is Rolores, literally her parent's ship name, but she's most often referred to as Skip, so that is what we are using. And by that time, their two daughters were already top competitive skaters. Lynette won the 1952 American Free Skating Championship and the 1953 American Speed Championship. And Skip was also a national runner-up in both free skating and pair skating. In 1954, Dolores and Roger would have their third child, Roger Ralph Adams, who got his first roller skates at just nine months old. Also, this article just fully says this baby's address. This is the era everyone wants to go back to, where everyone was saying ethnic slurs and doxing babies. <laughs> the Tacoma Roller Bowl would close its doors in 1984, and if you go there today, you'll find a car dealership with some suspiciously smooth floors. Skip Adams, later Skip Peterson, would continue coaching junior roller skaters, and she would regularly have meetups with other regulars from the Tacoma Roller Bowl. Lynette and her husband Ted would start their own roller skate company, National Skate, which is still run today by their son Terry Werner. But unlike his sisters, Roger would retire from skating pretty early. Although he helped design sound and lighting systems for local skating rinks to help pay for college, Roger wasn't interested in taking over the family business, and because he was a man, that was a big deal, I guess. Instead, Roger would get his master's degree in psychology and worked as a crisis associate and mental health counselor for the state of Oregon. But by the mid-1990s, Roger was no longer working with individual patients, and he was instead working in a supervisory role. 
I mean, Rogers said he was basically a counselor to other counselors. He became increasingly disillusioned by the mental health system and the bureaucracy of his new role. He was on call 24-7 and he was exhausted. And at the same time, his marriage to his college sweetheart of 21 years had begun to dissolve. Roger experienced what he described as complete professional burnout and just a textbook midlife crisis. At that point, he left his home in Oregon and went to stay with his friend in Huntington Beach, California with seemingly no plans for his future. But one day, as Roger is watching neighborhood kids roll up and down the sidewalk in their inline skates, he has a vision. He ran into his friend's garage with a heated butter knife and cannibalized at least four pairs of sneakers in the first few hours. I mean, you can probably imagine what his ex-wife, his children, and his friend must have thought when they just saw him shoving plastic wheels into old shoes. Depressed? I'm the furthest thing from depressed. I mean, look at what I've accomplished. Do you see him? Do you think a depressed person could make this? No. He said, I had a concept. I wanted the wearer to be able to walk normally and then roll. There is a stealth nature to Heelys. When you see a kid wearing them, you wouldn't know there's a wheel in the sneaker until they started to roll. That's right, these kids could fly away at 30 miles per hour at any second. But almost immediately, Roger took his life savings, at that time $150,000, and put it all towards developing the Heelys. He continued to test his product over the next year and a half, at one point losing three of his front teeth testing a prototype. And like any young entrepreneur living the American dream, he pulled himself up by his bootstrap and called his very rich family member, his cousin Richard, who owned a Ford dealership in Texas. Richard was able to put Roger in contact with a local patent attorney, Rob Ward. Roger also started working at his cousin's dealership to help pay for legal fees. I also like to imagine that while Roger was showing people the 1999 Ford Taurus, he's just doing loop-de-loops around the customers because uh, the grind does not stop. So Roger moved to Texas to meet with his patent attorney and find potential investors. But when he was driving to Dallas, his car was rear-ended and burst into flames. I mean, everything was in that car, his clothes, his prototype, his business plan. So he did what anyone would do and crawled back into a burning car to save his Heelys before being driven by ambulance to the nearest hospital. But that's just a normal day when you have the grind set mindset. Grind like skateboarding. Yeah, that's a joke, right? Luckily for Roger, uh, one, he lived, and two, his patent attorney, Rob, had shown his son one of the promotional videos they had made to eventually show off to investors. And Rob's son, Rob too, was like, oh my god, this is the sickest thing I've ever seen. Rob too goes over to his friend's house and is like, dude, you gotta see this video of sneakers with wheels. I mean, it's way better than the three channels that are on TV right now. That's how many channels we had in the early 2000s, right? And it just so happened that this friend, we also don't know the name of the friend, uh, Steve, sure, Steve, Steve's dad, Patrick Hammer, also saw the video. And Patrick Hammer just so happened to be a venture capitalist who immediately had his firm, Capital Southwest, invest $2.4 million and hopefully pay for Roger's second degree burns. Is he okay? But with that amount of investment, Capital Southwest wasn't just gonna let some psychologist with no business experience run the company by himself. So in May of 2000, Capital Southwest brings in Mike Staffaroni. And based on what we know about Mike, I'm not sure they could have found a better person for the company if they had tried. Before joining Keeley's, Mike had just left the company Rollerblade. Yeah, that's a brand, not just another name for roller skates. Even before working at Rollerblade, he had worked with major brands like Keds and Converse. So this guy had a lot of very specific knowledge about marketing, footwear, and skating products. I mean, sounds like a match made in heaven. Except we now know, and honestly you could kind of tell even then, that Mike and Roger hated each other. <laughs> Mike was not brought onto the team without a lot of negotiating, apparently. Roger, of course, was very attached to the product, but according to Mike, Roger was too emotional and he didn't understand the business. Roger and Mike also had very different expectations as to how fast Heelys would take off and how big it would be. Roger predicted Heelys would make $70 million in the first year. And Mike was like, hmm, maybe eight. Eight million, but eight. 
But Mike was intrigued, and he agreed to work as a consultant with Healy's for six months. Even though Mike and Roger did not get along, Mike probably on some level knew this product had the potential to be huge, because skateboarding was at its absolute peak in popularity during this time. The X Games was first televised in 1995, with an estimated 200,000 people just in physical attendance, that doesn't count the people who are watching it on TV. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was released in 1999 and was the third best-selling video game in 1999 and 2000 and inspired countless knockoff skating games for years to come. In September of 2000, Mike went to the biannual action sports retailer trade show in San Diego, which was the show for anything board sports and athletic footwear. When Mike enlisted a couple of skaters to demonstrate the prototypes, the Healy's booth was immediately swarmed with spectators. There was a stealth nature to it that grabs people's attention. It looks like a normal shoe, but you can lift your toe and roll. So there was the wow factor that comes with it. They immediately left the show with a bunch of orders from different brands, and Mike was brought on as the CEO. And Mike was like, well, this is great. We'll have plenty of customers when we launch in the spring, and, you know, in the meantime, we can do some safety tests, work out the kinks, work on the design a little bit. But Capital Southwest saw how many orders they had, and they said, hmm... How about we do a holiday release instead, and just skip all that testing stuff? The Heelys were first sold in 20 Journey stores across the country, with almost all of the units they could have made in that short span of time. A few days after sending the Heelys over to Journeys, Mike gets a call, asking, so how many more pairs of Heelys do y'all have left in the warehouse? And Mike is like, I, I don't know, like a few thousand? And Journey says, we'll take them. In their first year alone, Healy's made $21 million in sales. And that was probably in part because when Healy's were first released, they were sold for up to $100 for children's shoes. Okay, yeah, maybe I get why I didn't have them as a child. Returning to Roger for a minute, Roger's story really took off with journalists. Even though Roger himself rarely gave interviews, I don't know if you can ask for a better American Dream origin story than the one he had. In the only interview I've seen where Roger's parents are quoted, 86-year-old Roger Adams Sr. said he was thrilled to see his son finally following in the family business. Roger Sr. said, Roger never followed skating that close, but now that he's back into it, it's just wonderful. Shortly after this article was released in 2001, Roger Adams Sr. would pass away, 2002. And when his father passed away, Roger's product was already a huge success story. And from there, the sales took off. Interestingly, Mike said Healy's didn't have a televised ad until 2005, but other articles said that there was a commercial on MTV in 2001. I mean, either way, most of the money that they did have at the time was going to manufacturing as many shoes as they possibly could. Mike was also a big fan of guerrilla marketing and would just send skaters with Healy's to skate parks, malls. But Healy's biggest success came from their celebrity endorsers. Supposedly, Shaquille O'Neal was one of their biggest fans and ordered six custom pairs for his personal collection. I say supposedly because I could not find a single picture of Shaq and Heelys. I couldn't find Shaq talking about Heelys. I mean, yeah, this was 2001, maybe it wasn't archived, but why wouldn't anyone save a picture of a giant pair of Heelys? They're kind of hard to miss. But someone who did for sure wear Heelys was none other than Usher in his 2001 music video for You Don't Have to Call. And U is just spelled with the single letter U because this is 2001. 9-11 really did change everything. This wasn't even a brand deal. Usher stylist had just picked up a pair of Heelys at Nordstrom, and I mean, you can't deny Usher looks real swag. So oh much swag on that kid. He like bleeds swag. swag. Of course, like any brand would do, Heelys tried to reach out to Usher and thank him for showing off their product. They actually wanted to pitch an Usher signature shoe and basically have Usher be a face for the brand. But unfortunately, Usher's manager blocked Heelys from contacting Usher at any time, and Usher's manager was Usher's mom. Yeah, Usher was the guy who said he couldn't come to the sleepover because his mom said no. We weren't able to make much progress because we just couldn't get to him. And if we did, a neighbor of his mom would be screening things and say, look, here's how it works. Usher is going on tour. And for a million dollars, you can buy a sign that goes on the side of his bus. So that was about it. We continued to make a couple shoes that we thought he would like, which we'd then send to him. 
Otherwise, it was a short-lived partnership, if you want to even call it that. Another Healy's partner who unintentionally promoted the brand was Megan Trainor's dear future husband, Daryl Sabara. Whenever he was on the set filming for Spy Kids 2, he'd just be healing around whenever they weren't filming. And so eventually they integrated his shoes into the movie. But the absolute best Healy's pop culture reference was this episode of CSI Miami. Bronson, do me a favor, make sure Wolf gets a picture of this. One of these guys was wearing Heelys. And each year through 2006, the company would continue to grow exponentially. In the first nine months of 2006 alone, Healy sold nearly 4 million pairs of shoes, with a gross profit of $40.5 million. The only company with a bigger market share for skateboarding shoes was Vans. And this was in part because Healy's would buy out anything that was vaguely a competitor. Actually, one of the major complaints from real skaters was that when Healy's were released, you couldn't grind with Healy's the way you could with a traditional skateboard. So to answer that, Healy's bought Soaps, their main competitor. Soaps didn't have wheels in the bottom like Healy's, but they did have grind plates on the bottom. So eventually, Healy's would release their own version, the Grind and Roll, which combined the designs of the two shoes. And actually, to this day, this model of Heelys is easily the most coveted by collectors because look at them, they're sick. But by 2006, Capital Southwest, the venture capital firm, began being much more hands-on with the business, despite them not really getting what made Heelys successful or really knowing what the hell they were doing, at least according to Mike. But Capital Southwest had the largest share of the Heelys company with 45% ownership. And in 2006, they decided it was time for Heelys to go public. We don't need to go into the details of this because stocks are a lie and they're boring and I hate them. But people made a lot of money. Roger Adams got 26.3 million. His cousin, who was now on the Heelys board, got 12.4 million. Mike Stafferoni got 4 million. And the Capital Southwest chairman got 33.4 million dollars. Even after all of these payouts, Healy still had 61 million dollars to invest back in the business. But there was one problem. Roger Adams had this tendency to disappear off the face of the earth, and uh, that's not an exaggeration. <laughs> According to this one article from 2007, calls to his home on the shores of Lake Louisville are unanswered, and when asked for help in contacting him, Healy CEO Michael Stafferoni says, I'll try, but his chuckle betrays the unlikelihood of success. We never tried to tie him to a desk. He just doesn't like the day-to-day -day business environment. Mike also in this article feels the need to say that there's no real tension between us because Roger realized early on that my skill set was different. The first time we went to a trade show and he started hearing about terms, discounts, and marketing support, he was fine to step aside and let me deal with the customers. Roger either stepped down or was demoted from his executive position at Healy's, but said that he was happy to step away from the managerial aspects of his position and instead called himself the chief tinkerer. He maintained his own workspace at the Healy's office, which he called the lunatic lab, where he would just spend his days inventing products. Roger said, for me, innovation isn't a team sport, or something that's done by proxy. It's a personal obsession. Also, unfortunately, I lied earlier. There, there wasn't just one problem. As the shoes got more and more popular, they started getting banned in more and more places. Schools, malls, airports, Basically anywhere with that sweet, sweet, smooth flooring, you couldn't use them anymore. Also, scientists and doctors started saying that Healy's weren't just annoying, they were dangerous. What they found in this study, it was at a children's hospital in Ireland, is that in a 10-week period, they had 67 kids come in with Healy-related injuries, everything from hurt wrists, broken ankles, cracked skulls. A lot of the kids in the study who got into trouble were novices. They had just started playing with their So Heelys. there's an age group. The World Against Toys Causing Harm, better known as Buzzkill Incorporated, ranked Heelys in the top 10 worst toys of 2006 because of the risk of injuries. In 2007, Heelys was the subject of a class action lawsuit from its shareholders. 
Basically, people who had bought the stock in 2006 said that Healy's failed to disclose or misrepresented the safety concerns of the shoes. In the complaint, they cited that Ireland study that found 67 kids were injured over a span of 10 weeks. A different study found one death and 64 injuries in a period of about a year. On the Healy's website in 2006, it said that you could wear helmets and knee pads, but they weren't required. And their early marketing featured kids without any sort of protective gear. Now, they do end up settling this lawsuit for $5.25 million, which is a lot. But I do just want to put into context, I think a lot of people get this impression that if someone settles, it means that they knew they were going to lose at trial or they knew that they did something bad. And the truth is, our legal system makes any lawsuit so expensive and so stressful that as long as the claim isn't completely frivolous, there's usually going to be some sort of settlement. And although I do think it's wild that at some point the Healy's website said, nah, to safety gear, the evidence that Healy's are dangerous is actually really not that strong. For reference, in 2006 alone, more than 200,000 kids had to be treated in emergency rooms for toy-related injuries. Actually, the most common toy linked to those injuries were scooters. I mean, I should know, my Bratz scooter got recalled when I was a kid, and the version I got after that was so much uglier. I mean, I lived, but at what cost? Most of the reported Healy injuries involved children younger than 10, usually unsupervised, who were not wearing helmets or any protective gear. And that's actually very similar to the injury patterns with scooters and bike injuries. Actually, a lot of toy-related deaths or just from kids going into the street with their toys and being hit by a car because the whole soldiers on roller skates thing didn't take off in the 1930s. So it's not that this lawsuit had no merit, there were safety concerns with Healy's, but it was not nearly as extreme as the media made it out to be at the time. But whether the shoes were seriously dangerous or not, it, it almost didn't matter. Because the company's only product was Healy's. So if they're getting sued over that one product, if that one product is getting banned everywhere, the company has no way to make money. Mike said that he tried to convince the board around 2007 to start expanding the brand, moving away from just the Healy shoe. But the board was like, how about instead of marketing Healy's to kids, we market them to everyone. Teens, adults, parents, grandmas, grandpas, everyone should have a pair of Healy's. But the thing is, Healy's are marketed to the 10 to 14 year old age range as a product adjacent to this countercultural skating community. And nothing is lamer to a 12 year old than seeing their little siblings and their parents have the exact same shoes as them. But it wasn't all bad and sad because Healy's were also on Broadway. And famously, only good things happen on Broadway. In the 2008 Broadway debut of The Little Mermaid, the performers used Healy's to give the illusion that they were swimming around in the ocean. Technically, the flounder actors were the only ones who actually wore Healy's. The rest of them wore a modified roller skate, basically, but they were very much inspired on the concept of Healy's. And the lead on Broadway, Sierra Bogus, talked about practicing in her garage with a pair of Healy she borrowed from her dresser. And the author of this article takes the time to say why a grown woman would have Healy's readily available to lend someone is a question that remains unanswered. Listen, you're writing this article in March of 2008? During the recession? So maybe let people live a little, huh? People may not have homes, but they can have a dream, okay? And if you've been watching this and you're like, I know that lady's face. How do I know this lady? It's him. It's always him. Yeah, Sierra has been in like five different Andrew Lloyd Webber productions, which I think legally entitles her to some sort of financial compensation. Before and after she was the Little Mermaid, she was Christine in the little known musical Phantom of the Opera. She was part of the original cast for Broadway's School of Rock. Actually, right after The Little Mermaid closed in 2009, she went to star in Andrew Lloyd Webber's long-awaited classic, Love Never Dies. So yeah. Let the lady Healy. Up where they walk, everyone tries. Up where they say that love never dies. The Healy 
Etsy stock plummeted 50% in a single day, only five months after going public, and just continued to sink from there. And in the beginning of 2008, Mike Staffaroni stepped down as CEO and sold his stock in the company. But that, of course, was not the end of Healy's. In August of 2008, Skechers released a statement saying they were offering to buy the Healy's brand for $143 million. The letter to the Healy's board revealed that the companies had actually been discussing a potential buyout since December of 2007, and Skechers had previously offered to buy the company in May for around $130 million, which Healy had rejected just outright. And even though Healy's stock had gone from at one point being $40 a share to less than $5 a share in a span of two years, Capital Southwest looked at this offer and said, nah. We're good. No thanks, actually. And it seems like the company just kind of coasted for a while from there. And finally, Roger had enough. On May 29th, 2009, Roger Adams resigned from the board of directors, and he took his cousin Richard with them. Get your own cousin Richard, Capital Southwest. This letter is very long, so there's some paraphrasing here, but Roger did not hold back. Dear fellow directors and interim chief executive officer, as you know, I invented Healy's in the 1990s and have served on the board of directors of the company since it was founded in 2000. It is with deep regret that I announce my immediate resignation from the board of directors. I am taking these actions because I feel that the board is failing to fulfill its fiduciary obligations to Healy's stockholders. My concern over the board's stewardship has escalated during the last year. As you know, Skechers offered to acquire Healy's in May and August of 2008. For reasons that I still do not understand, the board never fully considered the Skechers offer and decided instead to reject it out of hand. I was particularly troubled by the board's refusal last year to negotiate with Skechers because it occurred at the same time that members of the board affiliated with Capital Southwest were advocating for a share buyback proposal, which would have resulted in Capital Southwest owning as much as 45.7% of Healy's. I was very concerned that the board did not establish an independent committee to ensure that the Capital Southwest directors weren't benefiting themselves or Capital Southwest at the expense of other Healy stockholders. He also goes on to discuss some other offers which the company just outright rejected. In the absence of any rational explanation, I can only assume that a majority of the board is under the control of Capital Southwest, and that Capital Southwest has some reason, as yet undisclosed to me, for not seriously considering these premium offers. Needless to say, if the board is rejecting a sale because it is in Capital Southwest's interests, although not in the interests of Healy's stockholders, for Capital Southwest to maintain its position in Healy's for some Capital Southwest-related tax, litigation, or management reason, such action is not consistent with the best interests of Healy stockholders or the board's faithful discharge of its fiduciary obligations. As I pointed out, Healy's incurs significant general and administrative expenses by continuing to operate as a standalone public company. Moreover, I believe that the company would benefit from being run by true experts in the industry. Indeed, Healy's core product likely would have significant staying power under such a scenario if properly promoted and improved. For the foregoing reasons, I am not comfortable with the course that the board is charting with this company, and I have grave concerns about whether the company is faithfully discharging or will faithfully discharge its fiduciary obligations to all of Healy's stockholders. Very truly yours, Roger R. Adams. And again, the company really just coasted through all of 2008 and most of 2009. Mike Stafferoni stepped down as CEO in February of 2008, and they would not get a new CEO until August of 2009, when they got Tom Hansen. Everyone give it up for Tom. Woo! Look at this very real, not edited picture. Tom Hansen was previously the CEO of TMTM Advertising and previously marketed huge brands like Hallmark, McDonald's, American Airlines. He was actually most well known for coming up with the line, life comes at you fast as the new nationwide slogan. Haters might say, wasn't that a Ferris Bueller quote first? But look at this guy. For all we know, Ferris Bueller stole that line from him. I mean, you don't get light up wheels like that being unoriginal, okay? And Tom Hansen had the hottest new thing to save the Healy's brand. The product that would finally put Healy's back on top where they belonged. <laughs> Thank you.
Introducing the Nano Board. Tom Hansen said the Nano represents a new philosophy around Heelys as a system, not just a shoe. That's right, now you can skateboard, but only with one foot while also still wearing a Heely. So it's a Heely in less convenient form. I mean, there is something so beautifully shameless about releasing an $80 product, which is functionally useless without buying another pair of Heelys and then not even using one of the shoes in that pair. And, and, and I, I'm holding some of the products that you guys make, uh, the Nano, the inline footboard, kind of like a skateboard, right. but smaller. It looks very cool. Uh, I, I'm curious, yeah. you know, your board decided, I, I forget how long ago it was, but Skechers had made a bid to, uh, to purchase Heelys, and you guys said right. no. And it was a, for an offer that I think right now would have been uh, double what your stock's trading at. Uh, in, in hindsight, should you have accepted or keep going? Well, before my time, so, uh, you know, it's easy to be an armchair quarterback. I think we should keep going. I think the stock's, uh, you know, it, it's it undervalued now. I mean, of course, I, you know, I'm going to look at it that way. But I think products like the Nano, uh, I think are going to be good for us. And, of course, we can't know for sure. But it seems as though Roger saw the release of the Nano board and said, hmm, I'm going to disappear forever now, I think. Even though Roger had resigned a year ago, he still had a lot of stock in the company. The Nano Board was released in July of 2010, and in August of 2010, Roger Adams sold his remaining stock for $10.6 million. And according to this 2020 interview with Mike Staffaroni, no one has heard from him since that time. Today, Roger Adams' invention is still around and operating under the name Heelys, but the inventor himself is long gone. The beach bum entrepreneur finally got the escape he craved in 1998. Without an online presence or any recent interviews to show, Adam's whereabouts are a mystery. Staffaroni can only guess where his former partner has been. We had a strained relationship for most of that time there, so I haven't been in touch with Roger. But last I heard, he's managing the patent and noodling around with some other ideas, living happily ever after out in Lake Tahoe. He's got a lot of dough, that's for sure. And wherever Roger is, I, I hope the lunatic lab is going strong. In 2012, Healy's finally accepted an offer and was sold to a private equity company for $13.9 million, I mean, just a fraction of what they had been offered a few years earlier. But Healy's aren't gone, they're still around. I would know because I bought a pair. I actually wasn't allowed to wear Healy's as a kid, but you know what? I also wasn't allowed to watch YouTube as a kid. And look at me now, mom. According to YouTube Premium, I watched over 3,000 hours last year. I should probably be more concerned about that. <laughs> the Healy's website is such a strange experience because there are clearly some very new designs, but also some very, very old designs. I mean, you can't look at some of these and tell me they haven't been sitting in a warehouse since 2009. Something about this pizza shoe just deeply unsettles me. I wanted to get the Jojo Siwa collab shoe, but sadly they were sold out in my size. They did have these fascinating sandals that look like Croc Heelys, uh, Creelys, if you will. They also had a surprising amount of licensed products like South Park, Minecraft, Guess, Baby Yoda, and oh my god, these incredible Hot Wheels shoes, look at these! They have wings on the side. Heelys has truly perfected their aerodynamic performance. Guys, real question. Should I fill out this collaboration form? We could all have matching Heelys. But anyways, I bought the most boring pair I could find because I'm not trying to be wasteful. I want to actually wear these outside of the video. And honestly, most of the shoes were sold out in a size eight anyways. It's, it's almost like these shoes are made for children. I asked Dan if he wanted to Healy with me, you know, my treat, um, and he said no. So I will be healing solo. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would. So my Healy's came pretty fast in the mail. I definitely do get the vibe that this box design has not changed, maybe since the Healy's came out. I, I honestly don't know. I noticed that there were some like weird wears and tears on like the box. And I did see on Reddit that a couple other people also had like really chewed up boxes when they ordered their Heelys. Obviously take that with a grain of salt because like those are just anonymous people on Reddit, unlike me who could never lie to you. But the shoes themselves like were totally fine. I did however see this giant uh, liability sticker on the bottom saying, hey, this is super dangerous. Don't do this, just rip that shit right off. There we go, ready to go. And I knew this part was gonna be a voiceover when I was filming this. This is not a thing I decided after the fact. But for some reason, when I started filming this portion, 
I forgot that I was going to voice over this part. So you'll see my mouth moving. Do not listen to her. She is only speaking lies. Ignore the woman with the, the moving mouth. I will be speaking now. So I, I was initially kind of surprised at just how loud Heelys are when you're walking around with the wheels. But you can really like. That's like another thing you can do. And I had watched some tutorials from Heelys and from different channels that suggested like, basically you're supposed to be trying to learn how to balance on your heels before you start moving. And then you're supposed to be using a wall or a counter or something to sort of balance along and try and skate along there. Then eventually you're supposed to work your way up to the step plant kick and your back foot is supposed to go behind your front foot so that you don't fall on your ass, which I did multiple times. Honestly, I thought I was gonna be able to pick these things up in like 10 minutes because like little babies do this and I'm not a little baby, I'm a big boy. And I'll be honest y'all, I don't really, I don't really got it. <laughs> the thing is, I think when you're a kid and you're learning this thing, you're just not aware of your mortality the way you are as an adult. And I was painfully aware as I was going to kick that at any moment I could slip hit my head and forget that you all ever existed. <laughs> so I do think that was holding me back. And I will also say, this is not the fault of the Heelys necessarily, but I did <laughs> injure myself uh, kind of badly <laughs> at one point. I had this brilliant strategy. Uh, the tutorials don't teach you this. I thought that I would practice wheeling into uh, my bed, sort of so that I would have a soft landing I was going to and I would be like less afraid to just like go for it with my thinking anyways. And so I was doing that, but what I did not account for was like the metal bed frame that we had. And so one time I like really picked up speed and just slammed my shins into the metal things and then fell backwards. And I just had like these nasty bumps on my shins. Again, that's not really the Healy's fault. No one told me to do that. That was my own doing. But I'll be honest, it's kind of thrown a wrench in how I was gonna conclude this video because I was gonna say, see, it's not so bad. They weren't so dangerous. It's not so hard. And I was gonna be like wheeling around and you would all be so impressed with me. But I've had these for like two weeks Granted, I haven't practiced like more than like three hours total, maybe. I still feel like three hours is a lot. I can't Healy. So where does that leave us? Also, I am beginning to get concerned about like scuffing my floor. So I'm gonna have to practice outside and I am actually going to order like helmet and knee pad and elbow pads because seriously, I came close to falling much more than I anticipated doing so. And this does kind of throw a wrench in my Heelys collab that's gonna be coming up because now we're gonna to have to hire like stunt doubles to do all my promotional work and that's just gonna be a whole thing. So I'm not giving up on these. I am going to continue to learn and y'all just have to keep bullying me in the comments until I can show you that I can do this, damn it. So I realize this is kind of an underwhelming conclusion to the video, but here we are, Heelys. They're all right. I can't do them yet, so I feel like I can't give a complete review. You see how this is incomplete? But with that being said, I do encourage y'all to get a pair. And if y'all have any tips on how to do this without like killing myself, I would appreciate it because genuinely most of the tutorials are like, just do it, you baby. And like, that's not helpful. So I hope y'all like this one. And I don't know if y'all have noticed, but we're getting very close to reaching 100,000 subscribers. And I've never asked in the history of my channel, you can look through every single one of my videos. Never, never, never asked for you to subscribe. I definitely have. So maybe if you're watching this video, maybe you could subscribe. That'd be cool. I wouldn't care. I don't know. I, I, it just, uh, it's a fun number. I would, I would like to get to that number. <laughs> and if there's another incentive, I have a video planned specifically for when we reached 100,000 subscribers, uh, a celebration video, if you will. So if you wanna be able to see that, subscribe. And you know, if you like this video, feel free to like, uh, comment, subscribe, all, all, that, all that stuff. I said subscribe like 10 times, have you gotten that? I will see y'all in the next one. Bye.